humans, you have entered the command zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. One, two, three, bow down. All right, what's up, everybody? You're watching and listening. Oh, man, I hope you weren't listening. The Command Zone podcast. That may have been one of our best renditions ever. We both did two parts. We didn't say a single word until the chorus. Uh, I'm your host, Jimmy Wong. How's it? It's Josh Lee Kwai. If you couldn't tell already... We're doing a breakdown of Josh's deck that he played in the last game nights. It's Grenzo Dungeon Warden, the Jailhouse Rock Edition. Yeah, he's the warden. Yeah. So. Elvis is the warden. Elvis right? is, yeah, yeah pretty sure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yep, we're doing a breakdown of the deck I played in the most recent game nights, inspired by a deck uh, that I saw Mel Lee play. Yeah, not to mention, this deck comboed off pretty hard, like three or four times, even through a bunch of Ixodrons. Make sure you watch the episode if you haven't. Before we get into it, though, uh, this show is sponsored and brought to you by cardkingdom.com slash command zone. That's right. That's the affiliate link. You should use that link the next time you are going to buy Magic Singles, Sealed Product, and anything else. They've got tons of stuff on the website. Very fast shipping. Great customer service. Can't recommend them enough. Cardkingdom.com slash command zone. And our other sponsor, Ultra Pro, has some awesome new products out. First of all, Relic Tokens, which we've yeah. been talking a lot about lately. Very cool. Helps spice up your battlefield. And they just announced they're coming out with 100 packs of Eclipse Leaves. I know... Yeah. Of course, all of our fans are Commander players, and they've been asking for packs of 100 for a while now because it is a little bit inconvenienced to, to buy, buy two sixties or their eighties, right? And, and you'd have to buy like five eighties to make an even hundred amount. So they're coming yeah. out with packs of 100, which very excited for. So yeah. good on you, Ultra Pro. A and the plus. final way to support the show is directly on Patreon.com/slash Command Zone. Big shout out to all our patrons who are awesome, and in particular, this episode. As with every episode, we're calling out one lucky patron. This patron is dedicated, or sorry, this patron, this show is dedicated to Jeremy Gribus. Gribus, or Gribus. 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 Gribas. G R Y B A S. Yeah, cool. Jeremy, man. you rock. That you do. All right, well, let's just jump right into it. Uh, Granzo Dungeon Warden. All right, cool. Thanks so much for listening, guys. <laughs> Moving on to the end step where we talk about something cool outside the world of magic. So, so. yeah, let's read Grenzo really quick. We're going to do a breakdown of this deck. Um, again, it was, I saw uh, Mel Lee play a version of this deck against me, and I was like, wow, that is really cool. Now, she had a Vampire Tribal build, which is very unique. Um, I went a different route, but I was inspired by her, and I wanted to give her a shout out. So, Grenzo Dungeon Warden costs. Black, red, and X. It's a 2-2 legendary creature, goblin, rogue, but Grenzo enters the battlefield with X plus one plus one counters on it. So if you pay three, it's a 3-3, three, three, four, it's a 4-4, four, four, five, mm -hmm. it's a 5-5. Five, five. It scales. And then it has an activated ability. You can pay two, and you don't have to t tap Grenzo or anything like that, so you can do this as many times as you have two generic mana. Pay two, colon, put the bottom card of your library into your graveyard, if it's a creature card with power less than or equal to Grenzo's power, put it onto the battlefield. So Grenzo cheats things into play. There's also a little bit of like putting cards into your graveyard. Mm -hmm. So that's a thing um, that you can also take advantage of. And putting cards from your graveyard onto the bottom of your library. Very few cards interact with the bottom of the library. Right. I mean, Grenzo doesn't put things from right. the graveyard onto the bottom. You're that's gonna, a thing you do. Yeah, yeah, it's a thing you do. Um, um well, importantly, Grenzo at base is a two mana two two, uh, so that is kind of where this deck functions at its best. Yeah, that's a really good point. I think a lot of people don't sort of get that about Grenzo when they first look at him, which is that you don't have to pay anything for X. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the way I built the deck was so that most of the creatures are two power or less, so that you don't have to pay anything for X. Now you can, and there's a few creatures that will take advantage if he's a little bit bigger, but in general. Mm -hmm. I wanted it. If he's a 2-2, he still can get most of the creatures th that are in the deck cheated out into play. Yeah. Um, and we should say, and we always say it, but it's it's worth reiterating, I guess, because we always do. You know, Grenzo's cheating mana cost, right? Because a two-power creature doesn't necessarily cost two mana. And like Alesha, who smiles at deck, or smiles at deck, smiles, smiles at, at deck. death, <laughs> um, takes advantage of the same kind of deal. Yeah. Which is like, there's a lot of 
creatures who are too power, but their mana cost is much higher and their what they do to the battle or on the battlefield is not equal to what their power is, right? Yeah. They have some ability or something. Yeah, I think a classic example I always talk about is the Oracle of Maldai, who's yeah. a four mana two two, right? right. Two two it's it's not supposed to come out as a four mana four four like on curve, nice beater. It has a very powerful effect and usually they'll place the power much less. Also the stuff like walls all have zero power. Lots of cards out there may cost a lot more. Uh, it doesn't match their power and toughness. There's a lot of creatures that are technically zero zeros, but they come into play and they put counters on themselves. Mm -hmm. So Grenzel will see that they're zero zeros and won't see that like when it enters the battlefield, it gets this amount of counters. So that's another sort of way you can cheat things in. Um, but first, you know, what I really found interesting about Grenzo is that, like you said earlier, there's not a lot of there's not a lot of decks that deal with the bottom of your library, right? There's not a lot of cards right. in Magic's history that really care about it that much. So it ends up being a very unique deck because it's doing something a lot of decks don't care about. I mean, seriously, what other deck even gives a crap about what's on the bottom of its library? There's very few. There's only cards that either place them down there. I don't think there's... And I could be wrong, of course, because it's been 25 years of Magic now. I don't think any card actually does anything close to what Grenzo actually does, which just takes those cards and put them into play. Right. I think there's some that may put them into your graveyard and all that, but definitely not just straight putting them into play. And I think it's also because people don't like Grenzo because it's like, oh, it's random, right? You, just, you have no right. idea what's going to be down there. Except, similar to the Narset decks, the Jaleva decks, and things like that, where you're stacking the top of your library... There are cards in Magic's history that allow you to sort of manipulate the bottom of your library. And one of the great things is, because this deck is so unique and there's not a lot of cards that do it, those cards tend to be cheaper than the Scroll Racks mm -hmm. and the, you know, Sensei's Divining Tops of the world. And also less seen. So you kind of get this, like, oh, I'm using a bunch of cards that would pretty much be bad in every other deck. You know, some people yeah. like that. I tend to like that. Uh, using cards where people are like, wait, what is that card? I've never seen it. <sighs> there is a couple in here that were very, very hard to deal with. <laughs> uh, let's start off, though, uh, to put some stuff down in the dungeon. Very flavorful, by the way, is the yeah. dungeon is the bottom of the library. What does it make the top? Like, just the top floor? Heaven? Heaven? The, the, I mean, drawing cards is heaven. The really fancy restaurant? I don't know. What's the opposite of a dungeon? The garden? <laughs> the garden, yeah. I mean, look, drawing cards off the top, it is like tasting from the garden. So it's good. Uh, we have two cards I'm going to talk about right now. It's Epitaph Golem and Junk Roller. Junk Troller, sorry. Uh, they're slightly different. Junk Troller is a four mana zero six. So it's a card that Grenzo can cheat out, importantly. It's an artifact creature golem with Defender. And you tap Junk Troller to put target card in a graveyard on the bottom of its owner's library. The cool thing about this is that it can be any card in any graveyard. Right, so, so you can, it doubles as like um, graveyard hate. Yeah. If somebody goes to reanimate something and you have Junk Troller out. I mean, originally you wanted to use it, of course, to put something that had died back on the bottom of your, of your library and get it out with Grenzo. That doesn't mean in certain, certain circumstances you don't go, wait a minute, you're trying to reanimate that? No, I'm just going to... Yeah, or flashback something. Yes. Or you know, target it with Snapcaster Mage. Lots of different things that happen to cards in the graveyard. Um, and Epitaph Golem is very similar, except it's a 5-mana 3-5 with 2-mana uh, without having to tap it. Put target card from your graveyard on the bottom of your library. Yeah, and Epitaph Golem, like you said, you can use it over and over. So if you have 4-mana, you can kind of maybe continue to do the thing, which is very the powerful. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the next card I got out in Game Nights, and it was very, very good. It's oh, Tell. so good. Yeah, it's Tell Jalad Stylus. It's a one-mana artifact. You tap it and put target permanent you own on the bottom of your library. So this is a pretty unique effect in that there's not a ton of cards that actually put cards that are in play on the bottom of the library. And we're going to talk about some of the creatures later that... You know, obviously, you're gonna have enter the battlefield effects, mm -hmm. and this allows you to not have to somehow kill the creature or destroy it to get it into the graveyard for then something else to put it on the bottom. You can just put it directly on the bottom, then Grenzo activate right away, get it back out, and yeah. you know, very powerful. It also doubles as a sort of somewhat of a threat against like people stealing your stuff. Yeah, or even just targeting it, right? Yeah, protection. Yep. Because, I mean, here's the thing. Your deck has already got ways to put cards from the graveyard onto the bottom of the library, but this is nice to just put it straight there. And again, if somebody did steal your thing, you can at least take it away from them because it says permanent you own right. on the bottom oh, of your yeah, library. Permanent, it's not just anything. Yeah. yeah, so if somebody, like, control magic something of yours and you get Tell Jaws Stylus out, you can at least take it away from them, put yeah. it on the bottom of your library. Or they try to lay claim something yeah. or steal an actual permanent. So yeah. That's pretty big, too. So, yeah, I really like that card. And it's very cheap. One mana. Yeah, that's huge. And you yeah. can tap it immediately. Mm -hmm. That's very powerful. Um, um, Clone Shell is a here's card. Here's one you would never play in any Never other deck. seen, <laughs> but it's amazing. 
In this deck, it's a five mana two two, so it comes out for free with Grenzo if you yep. pay him for cast him for a zero equals X. It's an artifact creature shapeshifter with imprint. You don't see this very often. When Clone Shell enters the battlefield, look at the top four cards of your library, exile one face down, then put the rest on the bottom of your library in any order. So this is serves as kind of draw one, scry three in a weird like in the, the scry effect, right? I'm gonna keep them on top, but you can put them down in any order. A lot of cards will say put them in a random order. And then finally, the more important part, when Clone Shell is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, turn the exiled card face up. If it's a creature card, put it onto the battlefield under control. So you get to cheat out the mana cost of something while also doing exactly what Grenzo wants, which is like helping you stack them on your library. This card is sweet. Yeah, um, I got that out in play. I've played the deck a few times since Game Nights. And it has a really interesting effect because, because you stack the bottom of your library, you get you know, something. Usually you're going to get at least one card down there that yeah. you can... So you know there's something down there that's good. And then you put something good imprinted on Clone Shell. And then nobody wants to attack you. Right. Because they don't want you to block with it because you could cheat out something crazy, like a Tali or whatever. It can be anything. Yeah. Um, also, you can just attack with Clone Shell kind of with impunity. They don't want to block it. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a really the interesting card. The old five mana 2-2 two -two coming yeah. hot, dude. But also you can get it out with Grenzo. So a lot of times you're not paying the five mana for it. Right. Um, you're basically getting it out with Grenzo for two, and then it's restacking the bottom of your library. So even if you only know one card, but it's Clone Shell, you're going to get a lot of value. Uh, yeah, I really like that card. Um, the next two are kind of similar. Boo. Yeah, and actually, it's funny because I was playing against Mel's... Um, oh, version of this? Version of this, and then I actually was playing a, um, I was playing my Chromat ne uh, Hidden Nekusar deck, and I got out this uh, Teferi's Puzzle Box, mm -hmm. and I we realized during that game, she I'm like, oh, oh, that's really good for Grenzo. It's that's so like, yeah, good for Grenzo. it's not hurting you. It's it's helping you. Yeah. And so that was one of the reasons I wanted to build the deck because, and she was like, I need to put Teferi's Puzzle Box in my deck. And I was like, yeah, that's crazy. So Because it hoses everyone else. I've never seen this card get played and people don't go, oh, no. It stops your plan. It hurts you. Again, in game oh. nights, you can see that we, you actually use it to break up a lock. Yeah, thank goodness. Um, so game it's would have been over otherwise. It's four mana for an artifact. During each player's draw phase, that player counts the cards in his or her hand, puts those cards on the bottom of his or her library, and then draws that number of cards. So what you do is you've got six, you untap, you've got six cards in your hand, you draw your card, you got seven, you put those seven on the bottom of your library in any order, and then you draw seven new ones. So every turn you're stacking the mm -hmm. bottom of your library and you know it's a deck with a lot of creatures that you want to cheat out with Grenzo but like every deck it's got lands it's got some instants and sorceries it's got some other stuff so you don't you know you don't have seven cards you want to stack it's two or three you do yeah. that you get them out with Grenzo the next turn you do it again you do it again and you've already paid four mana for the puzzle box so you'll be able to activate Grenzo at least twice hopefully yeah so um, and the other card that's similar to it is Mind Moil, and it's four and a red for an enchantment. And it says whenever you play a spell, put the cards in your hand on the bottom of your library in any order, then draw that many cards. So every time you play a spell, you do the Teferi's Puzzle Box effect. Right. So you play one, maybe an instant or sorcery, then put the best creature on the bottom of your library, draw new ones. Cheat it out. Do that again, do that again. It really gets the snowball rolling downhill once you get those cards out with enough cards in your hand. Yeah. Um, um, this next one's, I think, the best card in the deck, or probably, one of them. Probably, yeah. It's Viserys Seer, and this card pops up everywhere in different combo it's decks. It's a very combo modern, card. Yeah, yeah. And, and definitely a lot in EDH. It's just one black for a 1-1 one, one creature vampire wizard, and it says sacrifice a creature scry one. So it's a sack outlet, which is always important to have in general. You, in, anything that says sacrifice a creature on it for literal no cost is great. And the scry one's even better because that means you can put cards, guess where? On the bottom of the library into the dungeon. Yeah. Welcome it's... to the dungeon. We should have done that. <laughs> <We> should... <laughs> Dang it. It's welcome to the jungle, though. It was... I know. <laughs> but I mean, the jungle's kind of a dungeon yeah. in a way. You know, it's hard sure, to get out sure. of. Sure, yeah. sure. Concrete jungle. Some minotaurs in there, too. Um, the thing about Viserys here is that it can be treated into play with Grenso. Yeah, and like right. you said, so the sack outlet part's actually really important because most of the ways... You know, Epitaph Golem, Junk Troller, you have a lot more ways to get the creature from the graveyard back onto the bottom of your library than from play. So a lot of times you're like, I wish I could get this creature into the graveyard because that will allow me to put it back on the bottom of the library and, right. and use it again. And so Viserys here serves two purposes in that you do that and then you actually get to scry and say, well, is the top of my library even better than that card? Then I'll put it down there on the bottom so Grenzo yeah. can get that out. And you don't want to be drawing those cards, honestly. 
Yeah, it, yeah, exactly. Because a lot of them cost a lot of mana, and it'd be yeah. way cheaper to use Grenzo. In fact, you see at the end of the last game nights episode how, on the very last, my very last turn, I'm able to churn through a ton of cards. Yeah, like fifteen to twenty. Yeah, I think. because of Viserys here, so you can just kind of go through your deck really quick. Um, because again, the sacrifice outlet costs no mana, so it's just as many creatures you've got. Um, and the last one is Crystal Ball. It's three mana for an artifact, and you can pay one, tap it, and scry two. So just very cheap once you get it into play to just scry two. This is just kind of a value card you could put in a lot of decks. I would say, mm -hmm. you know, if you can't afford Sensei's Divining Top, this is a decent alternative oh, yeah, totally. to that of just, like, evening out your draws. You know, maybe you need lands, whatever. And then, of course, in Grenzo, you care about what's on the bottom. So scry yeah. in general, just very good in Grenzo. Treasure Map as well is, yeah. is a new card that does a similar thing. Um, all right. Well... Want to talk about how this is card draw? Oh, yeah. That's a really interesting point. Yeah, I consider most of this stuff in the card draw category. So, you know how we say 10 card draw, 10 mana ramp uh, in most decks. Well, in this deck, Epitaph Golem, Junk Troller, you know, Teferi's Puzzle Box, Teljalad Stylus, I, I would count them all as card draw because you're able to sort of put that card on the bottom of your deck and then use that card. Right as if it were a card in your hand. And so I sort of counted them in the same category. As it's card draw, draw and ramp if you have Grenzo out because you're paying yeah. less for the total mana cost. Not yeah. to mention it can be colorless. It's Yeah, it, it crosses over into some other categories. It's a little bit tutoring because you're yeah. like, well, I want this one. Um, but I considered it sort of like maybe half of a card draw card or, or three quarters. You know, I still have some actual card draw in the deck, but mm -hmm. you know, I don't want 10 Phyrexian Arena type cards and all this because that's just too much value and not enough doing of things, so... True. Um, okay, so now we know what's on the bottom of our deck because of all these cards. So what cards should we put down there onto the bottom of our deck? I like the name of this category. It's Release the Prisoners. Release the Prisoners. Let them run free. They're singing too much Jailhouse Rock. <laughs> so I want most of these things to be in the two power, maybe three power category. I don't want to have to pay a ton for Grenzo. Especially Grenzo's going to get removed sometimes, and I don't, you know... If you build this deck and you need him to be at four or five, then all of a sudden he dies twice and you have to pay like eight. It's just... Yeah, that's rough. It's not a position I want to be in. So, And there's enough powerful creatures in the two and three power slot that I think that's totally fine. Um, so one of the things you can do with a deck like this is sort of build it a little bit toolboxy, uh, have a lot of different types of effects so you can deal with different situations, which... I think if you've been paying attention for the last 200 episodes is a way that I definitely like to build my decks. I don't like yes. to... I don't like to feel like going into a game, there's situations I won't be able to handle. I like to be yeah. like, if somebody gets a lot of creatures, I have an answer for that. If somebody gets yeah. one big creature, I have an answer. If they do this, I have an answer somewhere in my deck. Mm -hmm. um, it's very powerful, obviously. Yeah. Um, so you want to talk about killing things? Because that definitely happened a lot in last game nights. Actually, when you started, when this started to happen, I went, oh no, I'm, I might lose, and this is going to be an embarrassing loss. <laughs> I think I was going to win... I was going to knock you out that turn yeah. until the right of replication with the Ixodron happened. Sorry. If you haven't watched Game Nights uh, yet, well, it's been a couple of weeks, so it's your own fault. Um, <laughs> yeah, that was... Spoiler alert. It's yeah, a good one. That was a turn where I thought I was going to be able to win, uh, except for Gabby decided that she had, a, she, had, she had a pretty good play. So Turns out the deck with all the instants is going to have it's some gonna answers. It's going to have some answers, yeah. yeah. I, I don't think I was going to win, but I was going to knock you out. Um, hey, whoa, whoa. Well, I mean, you were ki you were way ahead at that point. I mean, maybe. <laughs> Allegedly. Um, so, yeah, there's some cards, of course, that sort of kill other cards or destroy other cards. So there's Shriek Ma, there's Necrotal, and there's Duplicant. All kind of do the same thing in different ways. Um, Shriek Ma and Necrotal destroy creatures that aren't black, aren't artifacts. Um Shriek Ma, you can evoke, but it has three power. Necrotal is two power. You can't evoke it. Duplicant is a two power creature that exiles yeah, very a powerful. card and then takes its power and toughness. All of them can be cheated out with Grenzo. <clears throat> and then you want these are types of cards you will want to reuse yeah. with Epitaph Golems and Drunk Trollers and things. Because you, you know, with Grenzo, you can get these turns with Epitaph Golem where you're like, play, you know, uh, evoke Shriek Ma, kill something goes to my graveyard because it was evoked put it back on the bottom of my library 
bring it back out, sack do it, it again. to sack it to Viserys here or something, do yeah. it again, maybe kill three or four things for six or you know eight mana in a turn. And just because you're playing Grenzo for two normally doesn't mean that you can't play it for free for three. Right. Um, just like let's say you have seven mana, you want to play it for three, and then you'll have four left over to activate Grenzo twice. So you don't yeah. need to play him for two at that point, so that you can get cards like Shriekma out. You can also get cards like Fleshbag Marauder, two in the black, three one. When Fleshbag Marauder enters the battlefield, each player sacrifices a creature. If you can just get someone with this, like on the stack, they have a Voltron Commander or something, and they're playing a card while it's being cast. You whoop, get flesh bag out, flesh bag out. You can really host some people. I, I I found that edict effects are surprisingly effective when they do work. I mean, that's obviously a true, like a very obvious sentence, but they can really host people because sometimes people just spend twenty mana, ten mana in the turn and cast Warren one Klex. huge thing. Yeah, yeah Warren Clex or whatever. Yeah, and I like what you said there on the stack because Grenzo gives you a unique ability to get creatures out at instant speed, right? Because his ability is an instant, so flesh bag can come out at a time in response to something and really hose them they're about they go to yeah. equip something or whatever also same deal epitaph golem junk trollers tell Jalad stylus that kind of thing can give you the ability to play two or three flesh bag or play the same flesh bag marauder two or three times in a turn and you can just hose people's boards because you're sacking the flesh bag marauder every time but they're sacking real stuff um and a lot of times people are insulated from the first or you know the first one mm -hmm. But by the third one, you're getting to real creatures that they don't want to lose, yeah, generally. Yeah. Unless you're playing like a token deck. Yeah. But in general, like I rarely have more than two or three creatures on the battlefield at once, I feel like. Yeah, and, and by the time, you know, like you're, there's usually like, okay, one, that's not so bad. But the second one, you're like, crap. Yeah. And the third one, a lot of times, that's just your board. Um, or your commander. That, that feels the worst. Okay, so the next one is sort of the anti-artifact, one of the anti-artifact toolboxy cards. It's Tuck Tuck Scrapper. It's... um. It says when it enters the battlefield or another ally you control, sorry, you can destroy target artifact. If the artifact is put into a graveyard, then Tuk Tuk Scrapper deals damage to that controller equal to the number of allies you control. So probably going to be one because yeah. not like you have a lot of allies. But it's a sort of ETB shatter. Very good card in Kiki Jiki, mm -hmm. that's for sure. Kiki is another card that could go in this deck. We'll yes. talk at the end about... Um, I don't think I built a sort of 100% power level Grenzo. I, I, I aimed for, yeah, you know what uh, Jason Alt would maybe call 75%, although I don't, I don't know exactly. Somewhere in that range, though. Next up, we have Gary, Merchant of Asphodel, three black black for a 2-4 creature zombie. Now, this card is very good, especially in the two-color deck. When Gary or Gray, Merchant of Asphodel, enters the battlefield, each opponent loses X life, where X is equal to your devotion to black, and then you gain life equal to the life lost this way. So you could drain the entire table for two each. You get six total, and you gain six life. That's pretty good. Um, That's just if, by himself. if Gary's the only... But you're going to have Grenzo out. Yeah, so, so that's it's at, at least, least three. three, which means if it's a four-player game, that's nine life and three damage to everybody. I mean, I've been killed by, by Gary many times where it's yeah. like they just have 20 devotion to black. Well, usually they'll devotion you, and then they'll also swing with all the creatures and stuff if they yeah. can. So there's just a lot of damage coming your way. Again, if you, let's say your devotion was like modest, like five or six, uh -huh. right? You get Grey Merchant out. That does five to everybody. You gain 15 life. Do it again Stylus. with Teljalad. Do it again with Epitaph Golem. Or even like a Sack Outlet and yeah. then a Epitaph Golem or whatever. Yeah. Maybe play Gary three or four times in a turn. That could be 20 damage to everybody. That'll, that'll end a lot of games. Not to mention you gain 60 life or so yeah. in that instance. Yeah. I mean, and that's just, I think, pretty modest. You could obviously do a lot. If you have a big board, it can just be a game ender. Um, another one, a new one I wanted to talk about. I was really excited, and that's I haven't cool. got it out yet, but I think the card's awesome, is Twilight Prophet. It's two black black for a 2-4 vampire cleric has flying. Has a send to remind you, if you control 10 or more permanents, you get the city's blessing for the rest of the game. So at the beginning of your Blessed. upkeep, if you have the city's blessing, you reveal the top card of your library and put it into your, into your hand, and then each opponent loses X life, and you gain X life, where X is the card's converted mana cost. You know, one thing I liked about this is a 2-4, so mm -hmm. I can sneak into play with Grenzo, and I can do it on the instep before my turn because it's the type of card where, like, if you play it and then just hope to get around to your side... It's probably not going to last. Yeah, exactly. Unless there's no Ascend. Yeah. So it's a really good card to sort of sneak out on the instep before your, your turn, get at least one activation, you get an extra card, you gain some life, you deal damage to everybody. Yeah, not to mention this paired up with um, Gray, Gary, yeah, and stuff. Yeah, because like, it's two, two it's, black... Definitely one of the best ways to win Commander is when the first time I played, I played against Kakusho for the first yeah. time, and I found out just how good it is when you get a gain life equal to the life lost this way, because it's three times what you're draining other people for. So the, the swing is actually huge in terms of how much 
life you gain and how much everyone else is losing. Yeah, you'll notice they've sort of gone away from that. They don't word the cards the same way yeah, anymore. Yeah, no more each opponent's just one target opponent, and then you gain life equal to life lost this way. Or they say, like, when this comes into play, deal one damage to each opponent, and you gain one life. Yeah, exactly. You, know, you don't gain the life loss this way. So yeah. um, you know that it's powerful because they've kind of started to shy away from it. The other thing I would say is there's a lot of Scry in the deck because Scry is good with Grenzo, so you can set the top of your library with Scry also, which means you can get like a big card there if you want to do a lot of damage with Twilight Prophet and, and gain a lot of life. So. Right. Um, and then the last one was just reprinted. Pretty this exciting. is definitely the closest you'll get to 100% build is, yeah. is playing cards like this. It's the Imperial Recruiter. That's how happy he is. Two in red for a 1-1. One, one. <laughs> I was like, what is that? Uh, when Imperial Recruiter enters the battlefield, search your library for a creature card with power two or less, reveal it, and put it into your hand, then shuffle your library. So in a lot of Kiki Jiki decks, if it ever got tucked, this is how yep. you find it. Um, but this basically is very similar to what Grenzo does. It's looking for the real relevant creatures, and you can play it from your hand, or you can find a way to get it on the bottom of your library. But Imperial Recruiter, obviously very good. Just reprinted. Get your hands on one. Cardkin.com slash command zone. <laughs> hashtag, hashtag, hashtag sponsored. Hashtag, hashtag sponsored, yeah. Um, okay, so that's the toolboxy stuff, right? That's going to allow you to respond in the situations and have answers to other people's stuff. But another really cool thing about Grenzo is you can cheat things that you shouldn't be able to for less than they would cost because it's only two mana to activate Grenzo's ability. And also you mm -hmm. get them sort of at instant speed. Um, so you get like de facto Vidalcan Ori. If you can set them on the bottom of your library, know they're there and then wait till the opportune moment, usually the end step before your turn. So... The first one, again, I did get this out on Game Nights, is Ignition Team. Now, this card usually costs five red red, so that's seven mana. Jeez. But Grenzo can get it out for two, two. mana because it's a zero zero Goblin Warrior. But it says when Ignition Team enters the battlefield, or sorry, it says Ignition Team enters, enters the, the battlefield, battlefield with X plus one plus one counters on it, where X is the number of tapped lands on the battlefield. So yours and your opponent's, every one of the tapped lands gets counted up, and then that's how many counters it gets usually, you know, I think it was 22 in was, our game. Yeah, it was a big one. Yeah, and you can tap all of your lands in response, float the mana, whatever, to make sure that your lands are tapped. Um, so you you can get a 20 or 25, or I think Sean Main played this against me once, and it was like a 34 power creature. <laughs> yeah. Was he able to use the second ability to end the game? Yeah, so here's the... I don't think he, he was, but um, it was scary. So the second ability is actually very relevant, too, because Ignition Team... This was how I was going to knock you out of that game. So Right, make a bunch of lands. Yeah, so its ability is you pay two and a red and you remove a 1-1 one, one counter from Ignition Team and then target land becomes a 4-4 four, four red elemental creature until end of turn, it's still a land. So you can turn your lands for three mana into four fours and you can swing with them, which is really good if you have a bunch of mana. Also, I like the ability to sort of sort of hold my opponent's hostage for board wipe. So right. if you're going to board wipe, fine. I'm going to turn three of your lands, and you're going to lose lands in that exchange. Yeah, that's actually a really powerful thing. And I remember when it happened in the game nights, we all stopped and had to like figure out the math together and what you could do to other people's board wipe stuff. Also, because we all thought Kenji had a board wipe at that point. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's definitely very powerful. I mean, three mana is a lot, I think. Yeah. But four fours, and they all are dangerous. <laughs> Yeah, I really like using it sort of on your opponents more yeah. than yourself. But in a pinch, you know, you got 12 lands or so. Being able to turn three of them into four fours and swing for that extra 12 damage does matter. Yeah. And that in that game, I was going to do that. Like, I was like, remove three of your blockers. I had a ton of stuff, and I was just going to swing out because uh, I had Tree of Perdition to put you down to five. Right, right. right. So, speaking of Tree of Perdition. Speaking of Tree of Perdition, this is another great card in the deck, obviously. It's three in the black for a creature plant that's a 0-13 with Defender, and really interesting, you tap it to exchange target opponent's life total with Tree of Perdition's toughness. Now, the reason that this is weird, and people get this wrong all the time, is that it's not that it just gives it Tree of Perdition's toughness, right? You can tap this, make someone go down to 13, but Tree of Perdition's toughness turns into their life total. So it could be a 0-40 if they haven't taken any damage. Yep. And then you can give someone 40 life. Yep. So, now, it's target opponent, so you can't then use it on yourself, right. which is a little bit disappointing. Um, but in that game, it was going to be wildly relevant as you were going to take me down to five and then swing with a bunch of lands. And I'm pretty sure I would have been knocked out. But Gabby saved my life. Thank you so much, Gabby. Much yeah, appreciated. Yeah, thanks a lot, Gabby. But again, this is a card that really benefits from being able to get it out at instant speed. Because the tree, if you just play it on your turn... <laughs> 
Ain't nobody letting that thing live. Yeah. All the board wipes, the single target removal is coming out. Nobody wants to go to 13. Yeah, it's like, that's the same reason that Soren is so good that yeah. no one takes you to 10 because you can play it and use it pretty much immediately. Yeah. Tree Perdition, you end step it with Grenzo. Yeah, so end step, it comes out and then you untap and now it basically is like pseudo haste and you can put somebody to 13 right there and sort of get them out of nowhere where they thought they were at so much life. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe infinite life or something like that. Boom, no, you're at 13. And then the Tree of Perdition is just the biggest <laughs> arbitrary number in the world. I mean, that's pretty great. So, um, yep. And then you can kind of get combo-y with the deck. And there are a lot a lot of ways to do it. In fact, there are like Doomsday versions of this deck. Really? Yeah. Oh. There are sort of Micaeus Triskelion combo. I guess there's Doomsday versions of any deck that <laughs> play black, right? It's like, yeah, put Doomsday in there. You'll yeah, find I mean, if you can play that. Yeah, exactly. Because if... Doomsday will win you the game if you put the right cards into that your deck. That makes sense, right? Yeah. You can, yeah, yeah. Very interesting. You can just make it so that your deck is just the perfect Grenzo combo. So there are like Miss Micaeus Triskelion type combos that go in this. Um, I'm just going to mention some interesting ones. And of course, I didn't put all these into the deck for game nights. We talked about this last episode why like going infinite's not the most satisfying as far as viewer experience. Right. But um, one of the key cards to sort of combos in this deck that I thought was interesting is a card called Workhorse. So Workhorse is six mana for a zero zero, kind of like Ignition Team, but it comes into play with four plus one plus one counters on it. So it's a four four, um, even though it counts for Granzo's ability as a zero zero. But then it says you can remove a plus one plus one counter from Workhorse and add one colorless mana to your mana pool. Mm -hmm. So what you end up doing is gaining mana on the exchange. So you pay two mana with Granzo to get it out into play, take four counters from it, it goes to your graveyard. You've gained two mana because you, you paid two, but you got four back. Yeah. Now, with Epitaph Golem or something like that, you could pay the two mana to put the Workhorse back on the bottom. Still have two floating. And then activate Grenzo, get it back out, mm -hmm. get the four mana. Now you're in an infinite loop, but it's not doing anything, right? You're just playing Workhorse over and over again. But it's very easy to find cards in Magic's history that sort of reward you for just creatures coming into play. Including the one that I beat everyone at the table with. So Perforos would be a very good um, sort of yeah. combo piece to finish off that that particular synergy. Um and then you're in an infinite perforous loop. Uh, you can do it also with a, another card, and it takes a few more pieces. There's Priest of Urabrask. There's also a Priest in Black. I forget what it's called, but they both do the same thing. They cost two, and um, in this case, two and a red. It's a two one, and when it enters the battlefield, you gain red, 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 so three red to your mana pool. Um, you can kind of, it takes some more pieces, but you can get into a similar loop as with Workhorse. Or you can just say, I'm just doing it for value, and this creature is just going to get me two mana sometimes. Well, priest or one mana works sorry. really well. With something like ignition team, if yep. you make it arbitrarily huge. You know, so you have like, oh, I can make twenty-two things lands. Oh, sweet, at instant speed, great. Yeah, you and know. and again, with the ability to put it back on the bottom of your library, maybe you do it to, you know, you you get it with Grenzo. You're ahead one red mana. Tell Jalad Stylus, get it. Now you're ahead two red mana. Like it's done some stuff. And yeah. if you can do that every turn, it just kind of gives you extra mana every turn. So it's interesting. You would need a sack outlet maybe to get really crazy with it, or you need this first card. Um, so the last category we're going to talk about is more activations. Um, to get the most out of the Grenzo deck, you really want to activate Grenzo a lot. A lot. And you saw this in Game Nights, how like I got to a certain point where like I didn't know what was on the bottom of my deck anymore because I got past the cards that I had stacked there. It doesn't mean Grenzo's bad in that situation because there's still like a one in three chance of getting something. You just don't know what it is. And more often than not, you're almost, I mean, I feel like there's always going to be a point where you have to do that in the Grenzo deck where you're just like, hey, I got extra mana, but I don't have any way of putting it down there or I've already let's used just my way already. Yeah, let's just see what's up. Yeah, and, and you can get great value that way. Yeah. And so there's a few cards in the deck that are just meant to sort of maximize your ability to activate Grenzo. And this first one is kind of like the colorless training grounds. It's Hearthstone. It's three mana for an artifact. It says the cost of each creature ability requiring an activation cost is reduced by one. Mm -hmm. And this cannot reduce an ability's uh, cost below one. So it's always going to cost one, but it puts Grenzo's activation to just one mana, which is halving it, which is crazy. Yeah, just Be going dup, 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 yeah, dup. Now I got so seven mana, and I can activate it seven times yeah. rather than three times. That's a huge difference. Soul Rings in this deck, though, right? Of course. Well, there you go. There's a perfect activation of Grenzo right there. <laughs> um, and then, yeah. There's Thran Turbine, which is, again, one of my favorite costs for an artifact is one. During your upkeep, you may add up to two colorless mana to your mana pool. This mana cannot be spent to play spells. That's nuts. So you just get you get a free activation of Grenzo during your upkeep every yeah. turn. And it's one mana to put out. This is in the Thrasios deck, too? 
Yeah, for sure. Probably. I mean, maybe. Maybe, yeah. You have other ways of getting... Janet. You want to get an infinite mana in that deck? Yeah. Yeah. Which, you, in Grenzo, you could go for the infinite mana route and right. just infinitely... Yeah, I don't... There's probably ways to make that make you win. But at one mana, it's definitely, like, an easy thing to get out, and if it just means a free activation of Grenzo... Because for the most part, outside of a few cards, you don't really care if they come in, you know, end step necessarily as much. Think of it as, like, sort of draw you a portion of a card every turn, right? Because yeah. Grenzo is going to have a chance of getting a card on the bottom of your library, even if you don't know right. what it is. This is the best when you're blind picking at the bottom. Yeah, because it's just like, well, I don't know, maybe I'll get something. And if it one out of three times, that means it's drawing me maybe a little more than a third of a card because it's actually casting the card, too. Right. Maybe it's drawing right, me right, half right. a card every turn for one mana. Uh, and the last one is sort of... We ended up putting this in a lot of decks these days, I feel like. Um, yeah. It's interesting because I feel like this deck definitely uses this better than like my mono red burn deck almost sometimes. Yeah. Just because it's Braid of Fire. You're guaranteed to be able to use You're it. You're guaranteed to be able to use it. It doesn't cost you a card out of your hand. It has a cumulative upkeep of adding a red tier mana pool. So it's going to go into two, then three, then four, every single upkeep. And this used to be bad because you would have this thing called mana burn where you'd get hurt by mana that you didn't spend as phases ended. Like you had generated too much magic and it like sizzled and like, like ah, oh, darn it. Went a little too ham there. <laughs> um, but that doesn't exist anymore. So Braid of Fire is great for decks that have a lot of instants uh, that want, that can play stuff during the upkeep. And yep. Grenzo can also activate during the upkeep. I'd say any commander that's in red that has a mana costed ability, then oh, Braid yeah. of Fire goes in there. Joyra, it's very good in Joyra. Because like you said, you're going to generate a ton of mana in your upkeep that you have to use before you draw your card. And if you have activated abilities, you just dump it in there. So if you could put yeah. it in a deck with Thrasios because of partner uh, mechanic, you know, having some red, then it's very, very good um, there as well. So, all right. You know, one thing I wanted to say that we're going to, we're done with the deck tech here. Um, That's why I'm shuffling. The it's cards. really a, it's in the, in the, um, was it the commander deck building template? We talked about how there's like different types of decks. Yeah. And I'd say most commander decks fall into the sort of value attrition, you know, mm -hmm. based uh, strategy. And Grenzo is like that to a T. It's very like, you know, generate value more than the other decks because I'm paying two and using a bunch of tricky stuff right. to like get a card into play that costs seven. It's definitely a combo deck as well because you need to have several things in play. At the same time, you can build the combo in different ways, yeah. right? If you have Braid of Fire and the other card that we were talking about, Thran Turbine, then you can just start doing it yep. without having to worry about it. Otherwise, you need to have all these other pieces out. Um, but you can still... It, it's cool because one doesn't necessarily depend on the other to make it work. The and only, if you have both, then you're really doing yeah, it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which is cool, though, because I like redundancy in decks. We always like to say that, you know, make sure your deck can do the thing it wants to in different ways. And this one definitely... I mean, you saw it worked through Ixedron because you could sack the creatures, put them, in the lab, put them on the bottom. It was very intense how that worked out for you. I, I will say that actually made me think the deck was better than I thought because I can't think of really a worse card for the deck than Ixedron. Yeah. Because it flips... They don't have their abilities, and the abilities is is what you want them to be doing. And yeah. the fact that it could recover from it a couple of times before it finally was like, okay, you got me. Yeah. Um, but even then, it still had a fighting chance at the end. Yeah. It went out kicking and screaming. It wasn't just like a, uh, well, I. it wasn't like a hope Hope my top deck's good enough to somehow beat your board. It's yeah, it was like, well, are, I'm going to turn through and look for something. Yeah, Maybe I'll find something. A yeah. bunch of actual outs that this deck can have. Uh, the last thing I'll say that I like about the deck, and made it particularly difficult on game nights, but is that's very challenging to play because right. you are constantly having to remember the order of the cards on the bottom of your deck. This is something I didn't consider before we shot because <laughs> I'm in an interesting position in game nights where I'm directing it, so I'm worried about what everybody else is doing just for camera. Just I yeah. want them to play the card in the right place. I want them to make sure that they say it clearly what they're doing and why things are happening. And so... If you saw the behind the scenes thing, I'm often asking people like, it's not, I'm not trying to tell them not to do what they're doing or change what they're doing, just how they're doing it. Because we shortcut everything in magic. You're like, yeah, um, I'll play this and you put it, you know, let's say I'm in a swords to plowshares. You go, um, you just put the swords to plowshares directly in your graveyard and you say, kill that. Yeah. So, or, or you kind of do the thing where you like swords it, point it and then throw it in your graveyard. Right. And you don't even say what the name of the thing is that you're targeting. So you just say that. You put it directly into your graveyard. So I can't have the card fly up. So in that case, I'd be like, okay, can you say I'm going to sort of plowshares your ignition team and play it right here? Move your hand out of yeah. the way. Make sure the card doesn't move too much after you play it. Oh, yeah. That's like small little details. Yeah. You have 80 things to keep track of. I was <laughs> saying this too. Like the brain takes a toll after those. Oh. And you got to start memorizing cards that are on the bottom of your library. Jimmy Ooh. knows that like at the end of the day of every Game Nights episode, I'm like done. I'm like 
my brain's just done because I've been trying to hold so much information in my head. I, I'm and as the game's going, I'm like, oh, I got to remember to ask him about that. Yeah, I got to yeah, remember yeah. them to blah blah blah. So for me, the added weight of like, okay, it goes Tree of Perdition, then it goes Workhorse, then it goes this, Shriek Ma, yeah. then it's Itali was like the worst. I was like, crap, oh crap, oh crap, oh crap, oh crap. Don't forget. <laughs> A few people did ask me, why didn't you play your stuff at instant speed? And I was actually trying to cut down on what I had to remember. So I was like, I'm going to just activate Grenzo twice now, get those two things into play because I don't think that information is. And then right. now I only have to remember two cards rather than four down there. Right, right. Yeah. But in playing it since game nights, like in real life and uh, normal games, um, I've really enjoyed playing the deck because of that, the mental gymnastics of like, okay. And then you have to really plan ahead because I'm going to put these four cards in this order but what if something happens and now I wish this one was yeah, in the other yep, position yep, yep, and yep. like, yeah, it's really That's cool. That's like the, the woes of scroll rack too. A lot yes. of times it's like, oh crap, what order did I put it in? Yeah, um, why uh, why didn't I put that second from the top instead of fifth from the it's top? It's not like Narset or Jaleva where it's just like, it's going to cast any number of them from right. the top four. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. You actually have to memorize all those. Uh, super fun deck. I would encourage you to build it and give it a shot. And it is different than a, than most like black red decks too. Which oh, is definitely. Like. This yeah. is the most value-based black red deck I think I've ever seen. Yeah. Like, a lot of black red is about aggroing them out or doing stuff like Olivia stealing creatures or cheating mana costs with Rakdos. But Grenzo's got a whole different game plan. Also, Commander was printed in Conspiracy originally. So yeah. a lot of love for that. So Reprinted you know, in M25. So you guys can get your hands on it now. Copies obviously surged in price after Josh played it on Game Nights. <laughs> I don't think I don't that's think true. That happened. I don't think that happened. <laughs> yeah, that's another good thing. The deck is mostly cheap because a lot of the key pieces are not expensive. And yeah. if some of the cards, the particular cards that you want to cheat into play, like the creatures are a little bit expensive, well, those can be easily switched out. But Teljalad, Stylus, Epitaph, Golem, they're never going up in price. Yeah, Nobody no, wants seriously. that stuff. So, um, Well, until now. Yeah, until now. Okay, to the listeners. I like this one. What commanders do you have that play cards mm. that really wouldn't be good in any other deck? That's so what makes commander commander, by the way. For it's, me. I think it's one of the big things, yeah. yeah. Is like this card. It's like when Craig takes out his phone and goes like, wait a minute, and takes a picture yeah. of your card, you're like, I won. I yeah. just won. That's that's the one. Yeah. It wasn't like, oh, this is just a pure value card, but like, nope, this is only good in this deck. Yeah, so what uh, what cards or what decks do you have that play super unique cards? Uh, would love to hear about that on Twitter, in the comments, et cetera, et cetera. All right, now it's time for the end step, <laughs> where we talk about something cool outside the world of magic. It's almost like the end step sneaks up on us every time. It's like right when I got to here, I was like, oh yeah, we did the end step. Dang Let's it. talk about fitness. Oh yeah. We've been, uh, well, you Jimmy. recently, yeah, I've been working on it real hard. L uh, uh, let's, let's talk about your routine. Uh, give us a little flex, Jimmy. Jimmy, if you haven't noticed, yeah, Jimmy is... <laughs> He's been hitting it pretty hard. He's he's bulked up a bit. Every a more day, tone, pretty much time. working out every other day minimum since January first. Now, um, how how uh, like how much time at the gym? Or uh, you know, I have a trainer now, and one thing I learned is that boy, did I waste a lot of time at the gym before. Like it's so easy to go to the gym and just kind of loiter around or do whatever. Spend most of your time resting. Resting, yeah, that's the big thing, right? You're like, I just did a set. I look at my phone. Get on Twitter. Two hours later, I'm like, oh, maybe I should do another set. So having a trainer has been really nice because I get to ask him constant questions about like, why are we doing this? Why are we only resting so-and-so? Like, what's the pattern? Like, what what's the theory behind this? And he's very much interested in the science of all of it. So I take, I mean, I can get a full workout in in 35 minutes. Yeah, I'm a 40 minute a guy. 40 yeah. minutes a day, three times a week guy. Yeah. I've been doing that for a while now. Um, the big thing, and I'm, I'm trying to bulk before I slim down and I've gained 15 pounds since the beginning of the year. The big thing is like you can't rest more than 30, 40 seconds in between sets usually. Yeah. Uh, and once you actually start resting more, you're not going to actually be doing as much for your muscles too. Yeah, and a big way you do it too is you sort of do opposing muscle groups so that while you're working yes. one, you're resting the other. And that, that's why you can right. sort of... So yeah. it'll it's not go. like I do a bench press and then 30 seconds later do a bench press. I actually go do something else 30 seconds later and then come back. And now my chest has had two minutes to rest right? because I did. Yeah, you know. and you can find different ways to slot it in. Or, I mean, another big thing, too, is like you do shoulders and back on one day. You do chest and biceps on another, and you do your legs. And if you're really getting hard into it, you can do your legs and an upper body workout the same day, too. Um, I mean, the big thing for me, too, is just consistently eating. And I never thought I would say this, but I am growing tired of eating food. I will never say that. Well, here's the thing. I also just switched to a meal plan where now I'm making all my food in advance for the week. And it's yeah, literally just chicken and vegetables or fish and vegetables. And it's not exciting. 
when you're in a heavy fitness regime, uh, you have to switch the or flip the switch in your brain that sort of looks at eating for pleasure. And it's like, yeah. instead of living to eat, you just eat to live. Yeah. Yeah. And it's more about hitting for me. And like, I'm, I'm really strictly trying to like hit certain, certain numbers. amount of calories. And, and, and the big thing too now is cutting, making it's called clean eating. And it makes a lot of sense, right? Ideally as humans, you would be eating just clean, not preservative based, not too much sugar, not too much oil, salt, whatever food all the time. But that's also what makes a lot of food delicious yeah. to our brains. It's <laughs> so true. So it's tough because you just I'm just sitting there. What about chunk. sriracha? Can you have sriracha? I can have amounts of sriracha. I think hot <laughs> okay. sauces. Right. I can't have ketchup because that's just filled yeah. with sugar. Ketchup's horrible for you, actually, yeah. But even the past two days since I've started, I just sit there with like a chunk of chicken. And you're just like, oh, you're just like, just chew it down. Just drink some water. Get it down. When I was in extremely good shape years ago... I had I I lived in a condo and there was a restaurant like there was an alley be, behind my condo and then I could walk into the restaurant and like every day of the week they knew that they served vegan tomato soup mm-hmm. and a, a chicken breast and that was my dinner like five days a week. Wow, chicken breast with nothing, so no salt, no pepper, no butter, nothing, and I would just come home and I put sriracha in both and I would just eat that and yeah. I would just like get through it. It was like not tasty. Yeah. You know, but I would just get home and I was like, I don't know. I mean, there are certain things you can do a little bit of salt, pepper, vegetables, yeah. like veggies are always going to be fine. Um, you just really have just... Veggies are actually great because yeah. they fill you up. Yeah. So you're not hungry. Yeah. Yeah. The the thing too is uh, I'm eating six meals a day right now. And yeah, because you're trying to gain. Yeah. But the thing is, at first I was like, I can't finish half of these. It's, and, and almost immediately your body's metabolism actually starts speeding up because you're eating more consistently in smaller amounts and it's all clean. So... It's not like taking time to process all the oil or whatever uh, other garbage you get to put in there normally. Well, you look good, man. Thanks. I got to say, I'm using you as motivation because there was like a Saturday, it was like a Friday, I'd skipped and it came Saturday and I was like, I didn't want to go, you know, it's Saturday. (laughs) And I was like, but Jimmy, man, he's going all the time. You got to go. So so it actually got me on my butt and I got to the gym. And then you ate fried chicken afterwards. I ate banchan, yeah. Yeah. Because we were literally driving home and (laughs) (laughs) we looked over and I was like, did that say Bonchon? Yeah. I had no idea. Yeah, they, they've they opened up a few now in, in SoCal. It's amazing. Yeah, so that's another end step. Bonchon, which is a Korean fried chicken place. Oh, if there's one good. near you, B-O-N-C-H-O-N, it is extremely good. Yeah. Um, little known fact about this world is that South Korea, Seoul has the best ch- chicken fried in chicken in the world. Yeah, KFC does not stand for Kentucky Fried Chicken. I, I really feel Korean bad because there's going to be a bunch of people in the South that are going to be like, no way, but I'm sorry, but I've had chicken in both places, fried chicken in both places. And, yeah. And this, the... The South Koreans, they know how to make fried chicken. It's really good. Yeah, not to say that Southern fried chicken oh, is it's, bad. You know, no, it's I amazing. Love, I love me some hot yeah. chicken, but oh my goodness, I'm I, I love foods that taste slightly sweeter too, and and banchan definitely in like the sweet tanginess. The soy uh, chicken. Yeah. Oh my god! But I like the spicy one too. Oh, in, it's in so actual spicy at in Seoul though, they, they cover it with like uh, leeks and like veggies oh and stuff gosh, too. That sounds amazing. Yeah. Anyway, so you got two end steps for the price of one, and they're diametrically opposed wait is Bonchon closed on sundays um i don't know because it was a saturday when we went it might be closed on sundays i'm trying to figure out what my cheat day is and that's the thing i'm looking forward to most do you have a cheat day i used to only have a cheat meal cheat you have a whole day well that's what my trainer said wow you can i'm eating six times a day the healthiest food you've ever seen in your life i I, hope i get a day i'm just saying you can do a lot of damage in one whole day yeah (laughs) my theory was always you can only do so much damage in one meal yeah it's a good point um (laughs) But he's he was like, you know, shock your system, give it something new to digest so it doesn't get used to the old stuff. I'm like, Yeah, you 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 say that now. <laughs> Have you ever seen the Rock's cheat meal? That's that's where it's at. Well he's only gets one per year though, right? Uh, well, yeah, but I'm sure he still ha- I mean the thing Doesn't is Does he, he eat like two pizzas and like Yeah, it's two pizzas, like three like chocolate cakes and like uh, it's amazing. But I think you have to do it. You have to shock your system a little bit, otherwise it does get used to the routine, I think. I don't know. I think that's just something we tell ourselves to allow us to eat two pizzas in a day. I am saving a lot of money on food, though, so that is nice. That is a good upside. um, You know, another upside of listening to this podcast (laughs) is we get to tell you about (laughs) the Masters of Modern, our sister podcast, Alex Kessler and Ben Bateman. They talk about the modern format and Mm -hmm. all things competitive magic. You can find them on Twitter at the MMCast or right next to us at Collected.Company. Our editor for the show is Craig Blanchett, Captain Infect, Mr. I... I guess. Mr. I. Mr. I. Mr. Infect. Mr. Infect. I don't know. I don't know. We got to work on the branding. (laughs) 
<laughs> but thank you, Craig, for now taking on the editing of the show. And special thanks to Jeffrey Palmer, as always, for the Living Card animations. You can find him at Living Cards MTG on Twitter. Actually, this is Balam Nahara behind us, too. Yeah, thank you, Balam, as well. Balam submitted uh, an entry for Game Nights. That was oh, yeah, the audition video that was on the yeah. uh, audition episode. And so did Jeffrey. Did he? No. No. Jeffrey did not audition for Game Nights. Jeffrey, why didn't you audition for I'm Game I'm just going to assume he doesn't want to be on it. That's too bad, Jeffrey. Oh, well, there goes a chance. <laughs> All right, everybody. Um, That's it. Thanks for listening. That's all. Yep. We'll see you next time. Thank you for your attention. For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator. Greetings, humans. <laughs> <laughs>